All right, welcome to this uh, special colloquium. It's uh, every year we award uh, one uh, or two outstanding young astronomers in the world. Uh, uh, and this year we are honored to have Professor Offner from uh, Austin. So uh, I would uh, pass this to our director, Zhou Yi, Professor uh, Cho, to give a briefing about the award and also to introduce our uh, recipient this year. Please, Professor Cho. Okay, uh, good evening. Okay, Professor Ofner and uh, good morning for the, all the audience. Okay, the first, I would like to congratulate Professor Ofner from the University of Texas at Austin to be awarded 2022. NCU Delta Young Astronomy Leadership Award. This award, established by the National Central University and the Delta Electronics Foundations, is to recognize the world's worldwide scholar under the age of 45 who have made outstanding contributions in the field of astronomy or astrophysics. The candidates are suggested by the nomination committee without regard to sex, race, nationality. And the final list are chosen by the review committee. The review committee recommend Professor Ofner as the prize winner for the 2022. Professor Ofner received her bachelor degree from Wesley University in 2003 and a PhD degree in physics from the UC Berkeley in 2009. She is now working as a associate professor in the University of Texas at Austin. Okay, her research interest is the star formation. She has published more than a hundred papers in the reference journals and made a significant contribution to the relay field. Professor Ofner will give two online talks this time. Okay, the first one, okay, is this one. The other one, okay, will be here on the tomorrow KM is for the general public. You are also welcome to attend that online lecture. Okay, uh, let me give the time back to, okay, Professor Chen. All right, thank you, Professor Cho. Um, nominally, we would have the speaker to visit us in person um, to inspire us and also to interact with the local community. Of course, because of the pandemic, unfortunately, we uh, cannot do this this time. But Professor uh, Ofner promises to uh, to visit us sometime still this year, uh, uh, condition uh, permitting. So right now, we uh, also uh, normally we will offer the award in person by the uh, founder of the. Delta Electronics. Uh, Dr. Bruce Chain uh, really has a fan of astronomy, so he provides, has been supporting to this award, has kindly record his um, welcome speech or to just to this. So could uh, Tracy please broadcast the, uh, the, the speech? Good afternoon. Professors Tela Ofner and all attendants of this lecture. I'm Bruce Chen, the founder of Delta Group. Today I'm very glad to see this astronomy lecture being held successfully. I want to thank the National Central University for hosting the event with us. As most people know, I'm an astronomy enthusiast. This is why I found the Delta Young Astronomers Award more than 10 years ago. This award recognizes young scholars who have made remarkable contribution in the field of astronomy. Through this award, I hope to foster more interaction between amateur 
and the professional astronomers. I also want to make the latest studies being popularized in Taiwan. These two years, although the pandemic disrupt people travel the meeting opportunities, it won't stop as it astronomy enthusiasts like me exploring the knowledge about our starry sky. I'm very happy that this year Professor Offner become our outstanding awardee. She is currently working in the University of Texas at Austin and particularly focus on star formation, molecular cloud properties, and evolution. It's definitely our pleasure to have her with us to speak on this topic. Now I need to stop here and yield the time to Professor Offner. I believe the lecture will be very interesting and hope all attendees will learn something new today. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Chen. So now let's start the, uh, the lecture. I will pass the time to Offner. I ask all the audience to mute yourself and save all the questions until the end. At that time, you can either voice your questions or you can, leave, you can just type uh, uh, and leave a message. All right, Professor Ovna, please. All right, thank you very much for that uh, warm welcome. And I want to say I'm very flattered to be chosen for this award and to have the pleasure of giving this talk to you. Uh, I hope that I can um, visit Taiwan in the fall, uh, COVID permitting. Hopefully things will content, uh, continue to trend uh, better uh, worldwide on that front. All right, so today I'm going to be telling you about how we can harness machine learning to study star formation. So there are, despite many years of study, so many questions that we do not know about our own sun. These are incredibly basic questions, which include why does the sun have the mass that it does? How long do stars like the sun take to form? Why is there only one star in our star system? And why do the planets have the properties they do? So these are just fundamental questions. So I think that the answers to these questions lie in the birthplaces of stars, these so-called molecular clouds. So these first two questions are related to the topic of stellar feedback, how stars interact with their environment, and that's what I'm going to be talking about in the talk today. This other question about why there's only one star in our solar system is the topic of tomorrow's uh, lecture. So I hope you can join me for that as well. So the theme of this talk is that star formation is incredibly messy. So here's one particular beautiful, messy, uh, young region, 30 Doradus. You can see there's a mix of very young, um, hot and massive stars and a lot of surrounding gas, which is only beginning to be cleared in some of these areas. So in this talk, I'm going to first uh, motivate uh, the life cycle of stars and why star formation is so complex. Uh, then I'll try to persuade you why we really need machine learning to attack this problem. Um, and then I will go over how we use that machine learning to hunt for signatures of stellar feedback, including outflows and winds from young stars. And then I'll conclude with some notes about future work and conclusions. So it turns out that we cannot directly see the conditions of how our sun formed because those conditions were dispersed uh, billions of years ago. Uh, and in fact, uh, our sun and its birth has been lost to time. Uh, but we can study uh, star forming regions around the galaxy today, so how stars are forming now, uh, by looking all around us. So if we zoom in uh, to a spiral type galaxy like our own, we see a variety of these dark clouds or molecular clouds where we have this very cold, uh, dark 
uh, gas, which is in the process of forming a star cluster, maybe thousands of stars all together, just like the one that might have formed our sun. Zooming in still further, we have a variety of over densities within the cloud, uh, these so-called dense cores, each of which is likely to form a star and star system. Finally, on the smallest scales, down about around 100 AU, we've begun to detect these accretion disks, which funnel material onto the star, and it's the remnants of the disks, these disks that go on to form the planets of various solar systems. So this is a huge range of scales, going from 50 kiloparsec down to 100 AU, many orders of magnitude. And in fact, it's gravity uh, and turbulence that really transmits mass and momentum and energy from the largest scales all the way down to the smallest scales. But there are, of course, processes that carry mass, momentum, and energy from the smallest scales all the way back up to the largest scales, which is stellar feedback. So first, um, a young uh, star like our sun, it's forming, would have emitted a protostellar outflow, launching gas up to uh, 100 kilometers per second and stretching out to a parsec or so. More massive stars, um, O and B type stars, emit very intense radiation and drive these uh, really extreme uh, stellar winds. So they photoionize the gas and then they expel uh, and push away a lot of this gas through radiation pressure and through their stellar wind, creating these large bubbles. Finally, the most massive stars will end their lives uh, in supernova explosions, dispersing this molecular cloud and then erasing those birth conditions uh, from um, our site. So altogether, this constructs a, a cycle of life, right? So this is a very complex, uh, multi-scale, uh, interconnected process, which makes it very difficult to study. So this is why we need machine learning or artificial intelligence. Now, some of you might hear these words and you might be thinking of the Terminator, which sounds incredibly scary, but I promise you it is not actually scary. So if you're a little bit worried, you can maybe think about this nice friendly robot as the type of machine that is helping us understand star formation. So machine learning is defined as a field of computer science that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So instead of giving the computer a model and telling it what it's looking for, we give the computer data and then have it tell us what it should look for. So it actually goes through the data and constructs its own model to find whatever it is that we're looking for. So we can group machine learning into three different types. The first is supervised machine learning. So basically, given a set of images, look for things like, but not exactly like this one. So I warn you, there'll be a lot of cats in this talk. Two, uh, there's unsupervised learning, which means finding a pattern or something interesting. So for example, in this case being used to identify tumors or abnormal cells, uh, can be used in biology for these kinds of things, as well as astronomy. Finally, there's generative machine learning, which is the ability to make new images or similar data. So these faces here look completely realistic, but these are all fake. These are all people that have been made up generated um, by a machine learning algorithm that is parsed through uh, thousands or probably millions of real faces. So why we need machine learning um, for this problem, there's three main reasons. As I said at the beginning, star formation is messy. So let me elaborate on this a bit further. So this is a beautiful image taken by the Spitzer Space Telescope panning across our galactic plane. You can see all the beautiful um, complexity uh, of the dust and gas that's making up the plane. The dark regions are actually the molecular clouds, which are absorbing uh, radiation and not emitting in the infrared. But you can see a variety of other very interesting features, um, which are shells made by young O and B stars. Now these I have identified by eye. Um, some of them are quite big and obvious, but others not so much. Second, there's a lot of data. So that one image I showed you is only an eighth 
of the data of the galactic plane. So one of the ways astronomers have attacked this um, is through citizen science projects, uh, where we basically put the data online and allow a variety of people from the public to look at the data and try and identify the features. So for example, if you logged onto the Milky Way project, you might be shown an image like this and asked, is it a bubble? And you would say yes. And then you would draw a circle to indicate the size of that bubble. Uh, you might also see something like this, uh, which has a shell-like feature, but it's not entirely clear whether that's actually a bubble or not. So human identifications have some pluses and minuses. So on the plus side, uh, we can engage the public in science, which is great, get them very excited about it. Two, they're numerous. Members of the public are way more numerous than professional astronomers. Uh, three, they work for free, right? So people do the citizen science project as a hobby. So that's fantastic. We don't even have to pay them to do this science for us. And finally, humans are pretty smart, so they can actually identify atypical cases. Um, so if you put these images uh, online, if there's something interesting in them, people will tell you about it. And most of these projects have links where people can point out something weird or unexpected, and this has led to um, some different discoveries. On the minus side, uh, people have different opinions, right? So there's no uh, one truth there. They need simple instructions, particularly if it's members of the public, they're not experts in astronomy, so we need to be able to explain to them what they're looking for in detail. Um, and they can be hangry, right? So depending upon whether they ate breakfast or not, they might be more or less optimistic about whether a given feature is actually feedback or not. And finally, the problem is that even experts, professional astronomers, don't know the right answer. We do not know the ground truth. So last reason why we use machine learning for this topic is star formation is messy, but it is also three-dimensional. I was just reading the chat. Um, okay, yeah, so feel free to put uh, questions in the chat as I go along too. All right, so what I mean by three-dimensional is here's a three-dimensional image of B5. This is actually a spectral cube. So as it begins to rotate, you're gonna go from looking from position position to position velocity. And you can see these features sticking out, pointing out. Um, that is high velocity material. We'll actually see that those are protostellar outflows. Um, and as we spin around, you can see that there is um, a hole in the top right, uh, which looks like a shell. Um, and maybe some of that curve to this region, B5, is also part of a shell. Um, so there's a lot of very complex structure in this three-dimensional data. Um, so um, in 2010, um, a group published a survey of feedback in the Perseus cloud, including this B5 region of Perseus. And as part of her thesis, Michelle you know, a very smart human basically combed through the data and identified by eye all of the feedback features. But it's not feasible to scale up Michelle or even ourselves to do this on a cloud by cloud basis, right? And it's also subjective. So how do we identify these feedback? Um, the answer is to use machine learning, which allows us to eliminate uh, the human biases, to do uh, identifications quickly, and to do them robustly. So I'm gonna talk about how we do that for two types of feedback. Uh, first, stellar winds, and two, these protostellar outflows. All right, so the method that we're using is a convolutional neural network. This is a deep learning method, which means that it is based upon the brain visual cortex and how we visually process and identify things in images, not just humans, but animals in general. So this is an example of supervised learning. Okay, so we um, are gonna let the machine learn given some input data. So let's suppose we have some data. Let's suppose we have something called a cat, all right? 
Now, if I ask you, why is this a cat? You guys will say, oh, well, there's characteristics of it being a cat. It's got ears, eyes, nose, tail, paw, it's fluffy. Um, and so all of those things make it cat-like. And if you see something like this, this also has a tail and an eye, uh, but you know immediately this is not a cat. Uh, but if you see this, a totally different shaped object, um, also with some of the characteristics, but a completely different color and shape, you immediately know that this is a cat. So why are we all so good at identifying cats? And the answer is that since uh, we were small children, we've been collecting a training set of cats, right? So I have a toddler, so it's been a really amazing thing to watch her collect her training set of the outside world and begin to categorize things and identify things. So even at the age of one, she could identify cats and was very excited about them. So the brain does this really efficiently. All right, so here's a training set. Now what these neural networks are doing, what your brain is doing, is not really this high level thing of identifying uh, characteristics, but it's breaking down the images and identifying a set of patterns or filters. So a cat might be something like this in our machine uh, learning neural network. So let me break this down about how the network actually works. So we begin with some training data. Our algorithm CASI, Convolutional Approach to Structure Identification, is a type of algorithm that uh, can be called a denoising convolutional autoencoder. So what that means is, given this data, we want to denoise it, so remove the noise, everything not of interest, right? So we want our algorithm to identify the cat and ignore everything else in the image. The autoencoder part is we need it to learn this data well enough that it can reproduce uh, with high fidelity this input image. All right, so we give it some training data and we've labeled that data so it knows what it's supposed to be looking for. All right, so then we convolve with a filter, creating a new image. We apply an activation function, or essentially what inter introduces some loss, which allows us to remove parts of the image or refocus and enhance parts of the image. We downsample, and this has the purpose of we want to identify the cat, whether it's right next to us or whether it's across the room. We, we need that scale independent quantity of identifying a cat. Now we repeat this process n minus one times, continually going through this um, procedure, and then upsample it back up to the original image, and then see how we've actually done. And by iterating on this process, we can converge on a set of filters at each of these different levels, which basically encode the catness of our training data. All right, so. Since this is astronomy, we're working with uh, astronomy data, not cats. Uh, so we need a training set. And what we use for this is numerical simulations. So hydrodynamic simulations of feedback from young stars interacting with gas. And this has the benefit of a, being a very detailed training set where we have the input. And in particular, we have a tracer field where we can tag exactly where that feedback is. So we know exactly what we are looking for. We have a very detailed set of labels. Now, the algorithm itself knows nothing about physics. So all of the physics is in our training sets. So we've tested this by applying it to the raw three-dimensional gas density. We've also applied it to 12 and 13 CO emission, which is of course a target because we observe molecular clouds in CO. Um, to make the training set bigger, we've run simulations and included different times, different magnetic field strengths, different star properties with and without noise to mimic real observational data to really flesh out this training set. So here's an example of CASI being applied to 2D slices. So here's the input. Here's the target. These are new images it hasn't seen before. So we train it and then we test it. And here's its prediction. 
So it's actually doing really well. Um, so here are three different slices uh, where it's identifying the feedback. And we've broken it down into true positives, where it's correctly identifying the feedback, false positives, where it's incorrectly identifying extra pixels, and false negatives, where it is missing information. So you can see from the blue that it is doing very well. And in cases where it's making mistakes, those are usually around the boundaries of what is true feedback. And if you look at this by eye, um, it is very difficult to see the feedback. This is synthetic CO data. So if you were just looking at these slices as a human, you would have a real problem trying to identify the feedback by eye. Yet our algorithm can do it. So as I mentioned, the astronomy data, these CO spectral cubes are three dimensional. So instead of having these two dimensional filters, which is what is commonly done in image processing, uh, we need three dimensional filters because we have three dimensional data. So we go through this whole process again, uh, training on simulations, and then we can apply to actual molecular clouds and then uh, compare to previous visual identifications. So Duo Shu, who's the student who uh, worked on this project, was an ideal human for this particular um, research because as a master's student, he had visually identified feedback in this data set. Then he came to work with me, and he was already a human expert on what this feedback looked like and what, it, um, what its characteristics were. So he helped to develop this algorithm and apply it as, uh, without this human bias um, to the real data. So here's an example of what we uh, might identify. So this is a shell um, produced by uh, maybe a more massive star with winds and radiation blowing this, this small bubble around it. Uh, this is TMB8. Um, and you can see that our algorithm has identified a ring-like structure around the boundaries of this cavity. Um, and it's doing a pretty good job. On a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis, it's identifying a lot of what we would uh, say by eye um, is truly uh, part of this feedback. Um, so this is going beyond what a human could do because it is using what is learned on the training set to give a very high, highly accurate pixel level map of the feedback. But the problem is we don't actually know how well it's doing. So we have to go back to the simulations and test our models to see what is the best way, the most accurate way of training our network. So I want to tell you the tale of two different models. One model is ME1, model emission one, and it trains on the total emission in a set of voxels, these 3D pixels. So a voxel is considered to be part of the feedback as long as it contains some feedback gas. Now this is exactly how a human would identify um, this type of feedback. Anything that looks like it's part of the feedback, all those voxels are included. So it's by shape. The second one is model MF or model fraction. Instead of training on the total emission, it's learning what fraction of feedback is in each voxel. So it's learning this mapping between emission and feedback mass. So essentially, it's learning a radiative transfer problem. It's learning the conversion between CO emission and underlying gas mass from the feedback that creates part of that emission. So here are two models. These plots show uh, mass and momentum, where it's showing the mass of our CNN, or Cassie, on the y-axis, and the mass identified uh, by a human, in this case duo, of these different shell features. And you can see there's really nice uh, correlation between the CNN Cassie and our by eye, but which is right. So here's the one-to-one. -one. So that is model ME1. It's just beautiful, very great agreement between these two completely independent methods. And here is model MF. So at face value, it looks worse because it's predicting 10 times less mass and 10 times less momentum. So which one should we believe of these two models? So 
To figure that out, we have to go back to the simulation where we have complete information. So here is the uh, CASI predicted mass versus the true mass as defined in the simulation. But remember, we know exactly where all of the feedback is. We know much, exactly how much mass, momentum, and energy is associated with that because we can track it in the simulation. So here is model ME1. Here's the one-to-one -one line. So that is the correct relationship that we want. And here's model MF. So this model fraction is correctly predicting the amount of mass momentum associated with this feedback. So it does this correctly because it's able to remove line of sight emission that's not associated with the feedback. So stuff that's in the foreground or the background of the feedback, which a human cannot separate, but our algorithm has learned how to do that. So that has shown us that our previous human identifications are probably overestimating the impact of these shells by a factor of 10. So this one model, ME1, represents how humans find bubbles, and we can conclude they can find them, but the physics that we extract from those identification is not really done well. So I want to switch to protostellar outflows and return again to B5. So B5 has this shell, uh, but it also has a number of protostellar outflows. There's a paper in 2011 where uh, this group went and identified by eye a variety of different outflows associated with this region. Now, I don't know about you, but these look like blobs uh, to me. Uh, the resolution is not super high in the data, um, and these would be very difficult uh, to identify by eye, even if you are an expert. And among my group members, we spent a significant amount of time uh, arguing about whether these were identified correctly, uh, just because they're so uh, blob-like. Um, in any case, um, this is a comparison data set and we can compare against it with our machine learning approach. So again, we created uh, simulations, produced synthetic CO observations, and then tested our models. So here's an example of a simulated outflow uh, showing these two different model results, the actual ones, and then the predicted emission from each of the models. So it looks pretty good. Here is what we get applying it to a, an actual outflow uh, in the Perseus cloud where B5 lives. Um, and you can see it does pretty well. So the white contours are our model um, overlaid on the emission. And it turns out this is, was one of the ones previously identified. It has a nice elongated shape like an outflow. Um, you can see that there's some stuff being identified in the top left corner. Um, and that is where a small cluster of uh, young stellar objects is. So that is also legitimately um, outflow material, we think. So here's our B5 again. And here is a map showing what our algorithm identified. All of the red squares are places where outflow were previously identified by I. The yellow boxes are showing new outflows. So things that were not identified before in the previous survey by humans. Another thing you can see is that there's a large cluster of stars in the bottom right. Um, and in these regions, it's so confused that the outflows get all mixed up. They're all combined together and we cannot separate them by eye. So this is something where Cassie can do an excellent job because it is not concerned about distinguishing one outflow lobe from another, it can learn what, how these outflows interact together and identify them accurately, even when it's incredibly messy. So what we find is that Cassie identifies all 60 of the previously known outflows that were visually identified. So it gets all of them. It also identifies 20 new ones. Uh, and including identifying some outflows that are part of 
very confused cluster, young clusters within these regions, which is a huge advantage over the previous results. So here is an example, new outflow candidate. Um, this is something, I don't know how it was missed before. You can see it has the same elongated structure um, of an outflow that we saw before. These right panels are showing position velocity. So you see there's a, a wedge of high velocity material here. Um, and this is exactly how uh, people usually identify these outflows by eye. They look for the high velocity um, gas that's poking above the cloud emission. And um, they have this, this kind of triangle shape, which is very characteristic. So I'm not sure how this was missed before, but our algorithm identified it and, and uh, we can map it very cleanly. You can see that this outflow in our model um, is actually able to identify the outflow and weed out to remove a lot of the molecular cloud emission that's not part of the feedback. So here's another example. This is NGC 1333. Um, this has maybe 100 or so uh, young stars in it. It's incredibly messy. There's a lot of outflows there. Um, and you can see that this is something, a place where humans would not do very well at all by eye. Uh, but our algorithm is able to go in here and pick out outflow material. You can see model ME1 is probably overestimating what is happening, um, but model MF is really doing a good job of getting that high velocity material above and below the cloud. Yes, and the 3D input data, the third uh, dimension, it could be either distance or velocity. So in distance, uh, we can use uh, the simulations um, because there we have the full 3D information for distance. But in um, the observational data, we just have wavelength, right? So we have velocity along the line of sight. Um, and that's what makes this problem so hard is because we don't know what the three-dimensional true spatial distribution is. We only have this red or blue shifted information about the gas. So, uh, but again, our algorithm uh, doesn't care what type of 3D data is. As long as we have a training set, that's where the physics is. That's where it's learning uh, what it's looking for. So our algorithm, particularly model MF, which we learned does better than humans, um, excludes most of this cloud emission that's not part of the feedback. So we're getting more exact, more accurate mass, momentum, and energy estimates. For outflows, we can conclude that the machine is doing at least 30% better um, in the sense that it found 30% more outflows uh, that were previously admissed. For individual outflows, it's actually, we find that humans were not doing too badly in part due to cancellation of errors. Um, when humans identify these outflows by eye, they know that there's going to be confusion at the cloud velocities um, and they know there's problems with the conversion factor so they make corrections for that and it turns out that their corrections are actually even though they're a factor of 10 are actually pretty good to bring it up with the more exact uh, answer that we get with our algorithm all right so now that we've tested this on one particular cloud we can now do a survey where we apply our method to four different regions. We have the massive star forming region Orion. We have the nearby but relatively wimpy star forming region Taurus. We have Perseus where we had that B5 region we've been looking at and we have Ophiuchus. All of these are very different and distinct regions. All right, so one of the bits of extra information we have available to us is the distribution of young stellar objects. So which sources are young and where they are. So we can begin to look at correlations between the feedback and the young sources. So what we did to make these plots on the right is that we take a box of a certain size and then scan it over the region. And for every, um, every uh, part of the scan, we count up the number of YSOs, we count the amount of mass, momentum, and energy in that box. 
So that allows us to make the plots on the right showing the mass within the box as a function of number of young stellar objects in the box. And this has all four regions on the same plot. So what you can see is that all of these regions follow the same linear relationship between feedback and number of young stellar objects. Now that's great because these young stars are what is creating the feedback. So if we didn't see that, uh, we'd be a little bit worried. Um, the other thing that we see though, is that all four of these clouds are following that same line, independent of whether it's a really massive a region like Orion, or whether it's a really dinky, low mass star forming region like Taurus, they all follow the same trend. So that trend is about one solar mass of outflow material per young stellar object. So if we look at the distribution of star masses, the average or typical stellar mass is about 0.5. So this uh, suggests if every YSO that has an average mass of 0.5 solar masses kicks out one solar mass material, then that gives us an efficiency of about 30%. So these outflows are then really removing a lot of material around the area of the YSO and setting the star formation efficiency uh, in these regions on small scales. So that goes along with about a solar mass kilometer per second in momentum. This is a bit lower uh, than we would normally expect. Um, and this is because the highest velocity material is not traced in the molecular gas, it's atomic. So we're only picking up the lower resolution, lower velocity stuff. And so this is telling us our kind of average outflow velocity just for these particular, um, these particular CO emission maps is about a kilometer per second. Um, so this is certainly an underestimate, but it's what we get out of the molecular data. So if we look at the energy and momentum, um, associated with these sources, we find that the energy is enough to offset the decay of turbulence over time. So that means that as these stars interact with their environment, they're continuing to inject energy and continuing to drive turbulence and allowing the cloud to maintain a sort of quasi equilibrium state. So because you have this constant replenishing of energy, within the cloud, these clouds can live longer and they will potentially not go into global collapse, right? So their evolution will be different. One strange thing about these relationships is that Ophiuchus, for reasons we don't really understand, is underperforming. So it is following the same linear trends, but it's offset below. So why the feedback seems less in Ophiuchus, I'm not totally sure, um, but it's an interesting difference. So the other thing that we can do, um, these feedback identifications allow us to have a full map of the cloud and a pixel level identification of where the feedback is. So what we can do is take a Fourier uh, analysis, take a Fourier transform, and look at the distribution of scales associated with that feedback. So these plots show the spatial power spectrum. Um, and the one on the left is showing what you get if you take the power spectrum of the entire map, just everything without the noise, but everything else. And what's on the right is if you only have those pixels associated with the feedback. So what you see is that there's a break that appears when you look at only the feedback emission. And this is true in all four clouds. So we think that this is telling us the outflow size and the injection scale in which the feedback is injecting momentum and energy into the cloud. So it's telling us characteristic scales, which is on the smaller end, as we'd expect. And the breakpoints do differ between the clouds between 0.27 and Orion to 0.65. And we think this is a function of clustering, um, how clustered the region is, and also how dense the gas is, uh, which affects the morphology and the extent how long those outflows are. So 
after we've done this analysis, this brings us back to star formation is messy, but with machine learning, we can begin to make sense of all of that mess. So we've learned that these protostellar outflows are really important uh, to clouds, whether we're talking about low mass clouds like Taurus or high mass clouds by Orion. This feedback uh, is significant and can offset turbulent dissipation, which suggests that these regions can self-regulate. Um, feedback is important in driving and shaping the evolution of these clouds and the star forming uh, behavior within. Um, this feedback is dense. The outflows are everywhere if you look at the maps. So these young stars are influencing their forming neighbors. And the star formation lasts longer just because of this added energy injection. So the, one of the big picture implications of this work is that with machine learning algorithms like CASI, astronomers can move beyond visual inspection and analyze three-dimensional images to pixel level accuracy. And they can do it robustly and very quickly. Yeah, so Perseus has at least two populated star clusters. Is it fair to consider it a single sample? That's true. So one of the things that we did with the analysis is we broke up the clouds and tried to look at denser clustered regions and less dense, um, less clustered regions. We can see some differences um, between these clusters and the more isolated outflows. The breakpoint changes a little bit. Um, some of the characteristics change a little bit. Um, but one of the things we did was, as you're suggesting here, was to break these clouds up and try and look at only the clustered images, um, the clustered parts of the cloud. So we can compare clustered parts of Perseus to clustered parts of Orion, for example. All right, so what's next? Um, what's next is pretty exciting. Um, I am part of the Starforge collaboration. Uh, this is a collaboration of people um, carrying out simulations of star formation using the gizmo code. Um, so what you're looking at here is a movie of star formation happening within a simulated cloud. And this has all of the necessary feedback that we need. So the colors here are showing you uh, something related to the density. So the whiter and brighter areas are denser. You can see there's little uh, specks there to where the dense cores are. You can see nice filamentary behavior. And this cloud is 20,000 solar masses with resolution down to, three, uh, to 30 AU. So it spans the largest range of scales of any simulation to date and while including all of this feedback that I've been talking about, protostellar outflows, stellar winds, uh, radiation, and supernovae. So if you look carefully, you can see this kind of bursty, elongated um, streams. That's the outflows. Um, you can see it's not smooth. There's these clumps within them. Um, this is because accretion is not smooth, but variable. Um, so there's all kinds of outflows shooting out here. Um, there should be some bubbles appearing soon. All right, in the top right, you should see these rings expanding. Um, these are bubbles created by radiation and winds. Those are two massive stars there. As star formation proceeds, uh, you can see it gets messier and messier with all kinds of complex interactions. You have all these stars um, clustering towards the center. The uh, movie is changing color now uh, related to the, the ionization state of the gas. So the outflows are hot. You see they're yellow. There's also a lot of ionized material in green. And as it goes around, you'll see that a lot of material is being cleared out. So time is starting and stopping. So it was stopped there. Now it's starting back up again. You can see um, Star formation is continuing. The whole simulation spans about 10 million years. So it's a really long time period in which we're able to follow the star formation. Because we have all of this feedback in it, we can follow it self consistently. So basically until the star formation shuts off, instead of stopping at a magic time, uh, we can follow the whole process start to finish. 
Um, you can see as we go along, more and more of the gas is ionized and cleared, um, being pushed out by the feedback. At some point soon, there'll be a supernova that goes off and you'll see everything suddenly becomes ionized, it turns green. So that's, that's the end game when you finally get these massive stars uh, dying within the, the cluster. That's the supernova. <clears throat> so uh, as the calculation proceeds, this gas is ionized and pushed out um, and we can get uh, the resulting young cluster at the end, sort of self-consistently. Um, so this is um, what we're going to be using to continue to do our studies of star formation. Um, we can now use these to build more accurate training sets, go after feedback from even larger mass stars, um, and have more accuracy as we go to much more massive star forming regions than Orion and uh, more distant regions where feedback is very clustered and complicated. So that brings me to my conclusions. So we've developed a general neural network method, CASI 3D. We can use it to identify structure and spectral cubes, uh, and we can train it to estimate observational biases like radiation transfer effects, opacity and projection, so effects that is very difficult for us as humans to account for. We find that feedback is everywhere in these local star forming regions. Um, but on the flip side, uh, previous bubble and wind feedback um, has been likely overestimated by a factor of 10, just because of these radiative transfer effects and human biases as we're looking visually at the data. Previous outflow feedback is underestimated, uh, probably by at least 30%, maybe more if you consider some of these clusters like NGC 1333. And finally, the net result, the big picture, is that the impact of feedback is significant compared to the cloud total kinetic energy. So I just want to close by saying our algorithm is public and online with training sets. If you have a particular problem, um, that interests you that's not star formation. Uh, the physics is all in the training set, so you're welcome to download it, uh, give it a try, see if it works for your application, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about that. And just close by saying thank you again for giving me this opportunity to talk to you all, and I hope you enjoyed hearing about how we harness machine learning to study star formation. All right. Thank you very much, Estella. You just Wonderful, and not just the science, but just the uh, the the machine learning thing is just uh, you know once you know before this machine learning thing it was the big data that that's the term right and it was uh, analogous to uh, to uh, teenager sex now it's even uh, it's even more exciting very good all right uh, so the floor is open I. Uh, 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 post my uh, my questions further, but now the audience, please, if you have questions, you can ask the question uh, directly. Uh, I have a question. Please do. Yeah, uh, for the last movie, you show the supernova explode in the in the um, um, star clusters, right? So those are type two supernova. Is is, is that correct? Yes. So, so does that imply that the type two supernova we saw um in the extra galactic they, they are in the uh, star formation or, or, or star cluster regions? Is, is, yeah, is that, I think is that, that what you mean? Yeah, I think that that is the implications. We find that a lot of the gas of the cloud is dissipated uh, first by winds and outflows, um, but when you get to really massive regions. Uh, where the, the winds and outflows and radiation aren't sufficient, then those supernova are going to be going off in, in dense material within the star forming region. Uh, okay, thank you. All right, we have a questions uh, in the um, message platform. Uh, Stella, can you see it? Yeah, About Mike's the message. Yeah, did you apply, apply any denoise or blur filter when you apply the CNN or just adjust the kernel to fit your requirements? Um, 
we did not explicitly uh, uh, pre-process uh, with the filters. We did, we actually added noise um, in our uh, training uh, just because the observations have noise in them and we need our images to look as much as possible uh, like that. Um, if you go ahead and inspect the filters uh, that, that are um, basically uh, determined uh, through training, they, you know, they, they look like sort of edge detection type things. Um, there's not a lot of specific information you can uh, determine from them. Uh, but yeah, we didn't really pre-process uh, by doing denoising. We actually did the opposite and adding uh, more noises. Mm. Um, I have a question. So um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, could you identify yourself first above oh, Nara? Yes, sir. All right, um, all right, but please. Sorry, yeah, my name is Bhavna Lalchan and I'm a PhD student working with Professor Chen. Um, so I have a question about uh, the encoder, uh, sorry, the encoder, decoder, and the encoder that you use. But you show the example of a cap, but uh, how about uh, in the, uh, the CO model that you have? Um, I mean, how do you, how do, you do that in, in, in that particular case? Yeah, so that's a great question. So for the simulations, we have this, these labels for where the feedback is in density. So in order to make labels for the CO, we have to do the radiative transfer on the labels um, and then come up with the labels after we've, we've done this radiative transfer. Um, so, so basically, in order to, to come up with a CO labels for the training, we have to actually do the radiative transfer on the, on the, the you know, input densities of our models. Is that, is that what you were asking? Yeah, um, that leads to my second question. So uh, the thing is that, so you have a training sample, which is again simulated, but uh, as, as you mentioned that uh, the, the star formation is messy. So how exactly is your uh, simulated model helpful in finding the actual outflows in your, in your data? And how much was there difference between, um, or loss, or however you say, between your um, training model and between the actual predicted model? Yeah, that's a good question. So we, we know our limitations. Um, okay. The simulations are representing low to intermediate mass stars, um, not really super massive stars. Mm -hmm. um, there's a particularly uh, really messy uh, region in the middle of Orion, which is, a, a, yeah, there's a massive star interacting with another star blowing out gas. Our model mm -hmm. doesn't work on that at all. Um, okay. So this is one of the reasons why we need this new star forge data, because it's complete. We're able to get the feedback all the way up to, I don't know, we have 100 solar mass stars in there. Um, so we're able to go to much more complex environments. Um, but a lot of the, the work in this analysis has been just the checking um, and the, the, the verification of the results by comparing with all these human identified surveys first, by going back and comparing with the simulation, um, by running as many diverse models as possible. Like we run examples where we have clustered, more clustered outflows to try and get the, the clustered outflows in the, in the data, um, okay. but yeah. Okay, so, so the outflows that you, that you see here, uh, the outflows are not only from protostars, but you also see from HH objects and from other sources too. It's not just limited to uh, protostars, right? Yes, though for the for the the jets, uh, we just don't see those in CO emission. So we have not tried to to identify outflows in in the atomic gas um, okay. and atomic lines. Okay. So we're really just focused on the the molecular um, signatures here. Okay, 
uh, I have, sorry, a third last question. So can you go back to the slide where you have shown uh, B5 and IC348? Because I work on first years too, but uh, we have a different science. We don't look for uh, young serotics, but we look for uh, brown wolves in, in the regions. So in the, uh, in the B5 where you have shown uh, the uh, young stellar objects uh, and in the in the right right hand side lower panel, you have shown uh, young star objects. I, I suppose that's from IC three forty eight, right? So yeah. which which um, the one sorry, you I have one hundred one hundred star yeah star cluster. Okay. Oh yeah yeah okay. Um, let me share it again. I think you mean this one. Yes, exactly this one. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, so, so we have a really active uh, young cluster down here. It's very messy. Um, there's no way you can identify individual outflows. Okay. Um, so the best we can do is to train on clustered simulated outflows and then use that to identify the feedback. Okay, so so uh, I guess this is uh, IC three forty eight, and and do you and do you believe so the the feedback or the outflow which you which we see from B five, do you uh, do you see that going down to this cluster to the lower cluster two? I mean, is there sort of an interaction of feedback between these two clusters? I think not a lot it, it okay. does seem like there's a separation there between uh -huh. them um, where the the b5 outflows are much more well defined and separated um, one of the downsides here is that whether you're you know a human identifying these or a machine you don't know what the source of that outflow is uh -huh. so we plotted okay. a variety of sources and you can guess uh -huh. um, like maybe there's one in the corner of the yellow square where, okay, maybe that's the outflow it's driving. Okay. Um, but down here, it's just too messy. We have no idea what, what is driving what outflow. So, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for it. Monty. All right. Um, Lin Chi Hong, I think someone raised hands. Uh, please, do you have a question? Okay, so can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, um, so good morning, Professor. So I have one question, Cesar, because you mentioned about um, in this the uh, machine prediction, machine learning prediction inside. So we can be use something filters to block and uh, something noise. So my question is that because sometimes we thought that is a noise, but maybe there is something manager for method just we listen or we didn't know. So um how can we to say this the filter to the best data so can block enough noise but also will be not message something manageable but we didn't know this message so that is my question thank you yeah so let me try and repeat the question to make sure i understand it so you want to know how we can distinguish um you know features from the noise and not get confused with the noise and um try and avoid um well, I guess making the most of the, the signal that we have. Um, is, that, is that the question? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the thing, you know, is obviously this is not magic. Uh, so once we get down to the noise level, uh, you know, we're, we're really constrained by the noise of the observations. You know, if, you know, if you're, you're doing observational analysis, you can try sometimes stacking and smoothing and, and all these kind of things to, to, to get below the noise. Uh, we're not doing any of that. Uh, once we get to the noise, our algorithm is not going to be able to pick up things below the noise. Um, so so that really uh, requires a different approach than what we've been training on here. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, something to clarify, uh, because of this pandemic, so we have been postponing our event. Uh, Professor Ofna actually is our 2021 <laughs> uh, uh, award recipient, but it's the event is held now in 2022. So on the poster, we didn't want to make the wrong date so that's that's why there's this confusion so we we are backlogged <laughs> all right so we are catching up 
All right, any more questions from the audience? So far, very good. I see we have we have some expert uh, in the audience working on star formation. All right, uh, maybe uh, uh, Stella, I, I asked uh, maybe my last question uh, earlier, just um, as you said, star for formation is messy. There is massive star that could play a constructive or destructive role. And there's also the, the, the feedback of the so-called trigger star formation. So I just wonder, uh, uh, simulation aside, how does your CASI 3D found in Orion say around massive star versus low mass stars? So except for that pretty extreme region in the middle of Orion, it seems to do pretty well um, in um, Orion A, for example. So Orion is a massive star forming region, but it's it's really wimpy, I think, in the way of, um, you know, really super massive star forming regions are. So we're, we think we're not doing too badly given our training set. Um, for some of these questions, particularly uh, moving out to, to larger regions, star forge is going to be really important because that just has a lot more complexity than the previous simulations we were using and will include these massive stars. So, you know, aside from machine learning, that data set will allow us to actually look at triggering uh, more specifically. Um, and maybe at some point we'll be able to, to pull out some other physics uh, from the observations by using this new uh, simulation data set. Um, but, but right now we can't say very much about, about triggering, triggering or particularly very high mass star regions. All right. Fair enough. Very good. All right, it's getting late, by the way, uh, in Texas. Now it's 10, right? Is it? Yeah, it's after 10. It's yeah. after 10 p.m. So uh, we appreciate you staying up with us. All right, the last call of any question or comments or answers. All right. Uh, if not, thank you very much, Stella Offner. Uh, right, thank we, you. Uh, we uh, as I certainly enjoy a lot, and I expect to see you uh, in less than twenty-four hours from now. Yes, and, that's right. All right, congratulations, and it would be nice to have you in person sometime soon. Yeah, I hope so. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.